Okay, so welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your weekly SETI seminar series. Today we're very lucky to be joined by Dave Demery, who's come across to us from NASA Ames Research Center across the road. Uh, Dave did his uh, PhD at uh, Indiana University in geochemistry, uh, and then did a postdoc at Indiana and then at uh, UCLA uh, before uh, joining uh, the staff at Ames. Uh, and uh, he is uh, now the PI on the NASA Ames uh, NAI team. He's uh, on the editorial boards of astrobiology and geobiology journals. And his career is focused on uh, the uh, a number of topics uh, surrounding the early Earth and uh, astrobiology, including the biochemical carbon cycle. Uh, he's uh, published papers on the stepwise oxidation of the Proterozoic Earth environment, uh, the early ev evolution of the Earth, uh, and preservation of habitable environments on Earth and Mars. Uh, he's also interested in uh, stable isotope chemistry of carbon and, uh, of, uh, and looking at lunar samples, uh, meteorites, oceanic basalts, and bat guano. Uh, and Dave has also... Uh, After 30 years, I can't escape <laughs> that. <laughs> has also published in microbial, microbial communities in hypersaline environments, which I think uh, we're going to hear a little bit more about today. Uh, Dave is also uh, part of the MER rover team. And uh, he's also a member of the instrument, uh, CRISM instrument team. And uh, he threw the first pitch at a Giants game on the 13th of May in 2004. So uh, <laughs> with that trivia, <laughs> forget all the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Dave. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we got across the plate in the air. <laughs> Never hit the dirt when you throw out the first pitch of a game. If you don't think 40,000 people booing you doesn't have an effect, just throw it in the dirt and see what, see what happens to your head. <laughs> but I got it to the catcher in the air. Anyway, okay, how did it get into this? Well, you heard a number of things that I've done in my career. And uh, I guess in, in the 70s, uh, there was a major revolution going on in, in isotope geochemistry and principally in the way in which you were able to do the analyses. And uh, my advisor, John Hayes at Indiana, he developed several methods for really looking at very small quantities of samples for carbon isotopes. And so when I got into this research with microbial mats, it was very much with the intent of applying these new techniques to understanding more about how these uh, ecosystems work. Uh, as I got more and more into these, though, as you'll see in this talk, <laughs> the isotopes began to sort of fade in the background as I began to realize that there are so many interesting aspects of these. And, and I think the significance of these communities now is, is grown, I think, in my thinking and in that of others regarding their role that they have played probably in the evolution, uh, early evolution of our biosphere. And so I'll try to touch on that a bit and then of course right at the end make a couple of uh, slides about uh, potential relevance to Mars uh, in, in our efforts to search for any evidence of life there. Um, it's always fun to start with the Darwin's Dilemma uh, and just to start by saying that, that all the plant and animal records that we know of occupy only the last one-eighth of Earth, Earth history or so. So the first seven-eighths of Earth's history uh, is one where we really don't see macro uh, faunal evidence or floral evidence of, of plants and animals. And so, you know, uh, we're all quite aware of the in incredible contributions that Darwin made, but he alludes to this one difficulty with his um, theories, and that is that they sudden, all these organisms suddenly appear at the lowest uh, known uh, fossiliferous rocks, at the lowest, no, lowest known at that time, which were Cambrian age, 540 million years or so ago. And it's indisputable that before the lowest Cambrian stratum was deposited, long periods elapsed, yeah, no kidding, Darwin, and that during those vast periods, the world swarmed with living creatures. You know, for his theories really to apply, there had to be this, this earlier um, uh, community of, of, of organisms. Uh, and of course, to, to the question why we cannot find these deposits belonging to these assumed earliest periods, I can give no answer. And of course, he viewed that this could be a, a critical, valid argument against the views that he had entertained. Uh, and of course, that's sort of mid-19th century. And, but the amazing thing is how much longer it really took before we made progress on that. And this is sort of a textbook representation of the Earth's history as, a as sort of a clock, where you have time, uh, the origin of the Earth at about 4.54 billion years going clockwise around to the present, just to underscore that comment about the very narrow slice of history where plants and animals as we know them, uh, you know, began and, and proliferated on the earth. And there's this vast period, as he uh, inferred, 
uh, where we don't have you know, much in the way of evidence of, of macrofauna or flora. And of course, this is the age of the, mi of the microbial biosphere. And what you see here is a summary as of a few years ago, I probably made this slide probably about five or seven years ago, updated it, uh, of what we have since learned about various groups of microbes uh, regarding you know, what it, their basic capabilities were and of course their antiquity. Um, and the, the very key point here is that the, our earliest evidence of life is not limited by whether life was there, it's limited by the quality of preservation of the rocks. And so, for all we know, life actually began at four billion years ago or earlier, uh, which is a very exciting thing, but at the same time very frustrating because we don't have a record to study to really understand, you know, what the situation was. Uh, a lot of these organisms, as you can see from the labels, are photosynthetic, okay? So that tells you right away that the record we do have that goes back that far is one of, of organisms that are able to live in sunlight, and of course that leads into a key aspect of this talk. Uh, at 3.4 billion years ago, some time ago, you can see here in sort of 2004 and then again in 2006, people began to see features within these really old rocks uh, that were very uh, indicative of, of flexible organic films or biofilms, uh, particularly concentrated in the shallowest, uh, shallowest water sediments, again consistent with the presence in sunlight. Uh, of these of communities of organisms and as you went into deeper water these things feathered out so there clearly was not only a presence of, of organic biofilms or films at that time and they infer of course that, that they were biofilms but also that they probably had a photosynthetic affinity as evidenced by the occurrence of these films as a function of water depth and presumably therefore intensity of sunlight so this was evidence you know from some time back that uh, indeed these these organic films are there uh, uh, Abby Allwood, uh, in her dissertation a little more recently, at, went further and actually said, well, not only were these biofilms there, but there were some forms in shallow water environments, and as we went to deeper water environments, environments the morphology of these organisms changed, and by analogy with much younger deposits, where we know much more about the organisms that were there, uh, these, these things that she studied at 3.4 billion years ago are, are totally consistent in morphology with the much younger biofilm type communities that populated the sediments in, in shallow water environments. And so not only do we have the evidence, you know, sort of spot evidence here and there of a micro, a fossil occurrence of these things, but we have now evidence of, of a community sort of going from onshore to offshore that's very consistent with the a much younger record of, of, micro, of photosynthetic microbial biofilms. So the key point is that these types of uh, features and these types of, of biofilm communities are easily the most widespread uh, evidence of early life on the Earth and um, also therefore imply that they, they're the best record of the diversity of life that we might have given the extent to which diversity maps to different types of environments in the past. So there's sort of a summary here and in a way it's a summary of why we're uh, very interested in studying microbial mats as working models of ancient ecosystems, and it's also a bit of an outline of the talk. Uh, and I think I already mentioned this, photosynthetic microbial mats are the oldest, most widespread ecosystems documented in the Earth's record. And they are, uh, and you can literally, by holding one of these in your hand, have a complete self-contained ecosystem. So, you know, it's very satisfying to know that um, it's sort of like a coral reef, which likes to live in very nutrient poor water, but it's really self-sufficient in its ability to recycle nutrients, all the interactions required for that ecosystem to be healthy, all pretty much very self-contained. Uh, and so that makes it much more amenable to getting an ecosystem level understanding of what's going on. Uh, a very important point though, is that because we are talking about communities and community interactions where different components of that community can, inter can affect each other, and the fact that this record is so ancient, it's an excellent possibility that that, that, that environment, that ecosystem, hosted several very key evolutionary events uh, in the early biosphere. And so therefore, to the extent to which we, we, we can learn more information about uh, what they might have been by studying the modern descendants of these communities, uh, that's a potential great research possibility, uh, possibility for discovery. But the other key important point here, and as I'll get into, is that the microenvironment within the mat is, is markedly different from the external environment. And the key point here is that if you take an organism out of that and try to grow it up in a culture in the lab, uh, 
you're subjecting that organism to an environment that is radically different from what it, the one in which it evolved. And as we've now come to learn, organisms can, can behave quite differently when you're putting them in one environment as opposed to the one which is the, really the environment and the physiology that you want to understand, the one that it, it harkens back to billions of years ago. Micro, these microenvironments differ markedly from external environment. I already said that. Mats create abundant and diverse biosignatures. The other key point is that, is that we, when we study the early record, we look for surrogates or sort of um, you know, proxies for, for the organisms that might have been there it, using a number of different approaches. And these mats are pro quite prolific in producing a number of examples of this, which I'll get into. So anyway, uh, reasons why we think it's really uh, it's exciting to study these. What we did is we went to Baja, California in particular, and this is about halfway down the peninsula on the Pacific side at a place called Guerrero Negro, which has uh, what probably pr close to, if not the largest salt works in the world. They produce 7 million metric tons of sodium chloride per year. It's a very high quality, nice big pure crystals, which you could use in table salt or of course for water softening or, or just a lot, and, and, and actually, um, the Japanese petrochemical industry is very dependent on this because all the chlorinated whatever is vinyl, you know, uh, all different types of plastics that have chlorine in them. That, those processes uh, depend on very pure sul uh, chloride, like pr very pure sodium chloride as an input. And this, this, uh, the scale of this allows this uh, salt works to produce very pure sodium chloride. But for our story, the significant thing is that this lagoon water, which is already a bit more saline than seawater, is taken in through some very large ponds, uh, this is, and these are actually the ponds at the end of the system, which after the water has evaporated substantially, produces the sodium chloride. But as it turns out, as the water, seawater moves through these ponds and evaporates, it gets up to a salinity where aquatic plants and a lot of grazers that would eat these microbial mats cannot really persist. They can't go through a reproductive cycle. And so you can see the sort of greening here as the salinity gets to two to three times seawater salinity. And these are these photosynthetic microbial mats that are growing on the bottom of these ponds. And they're very extensive. This, this pond here, these two ponds collectively are 20 square kilometers. So this is an enormous salt works, much bigger than the ones here in San Francisco Bay. But the point is, it's a wonderful system in the sense that they maintain constant conditions so they can maintain constant production of their sodium chloride, which means we have sort of a chemostat. We have a natural laboratory set up in, under, stable, or under stable conditions that exclude competitors, we can study these very well-developed photosynthetic microbial mats. So in a way, by upping up the salinity a bit, we can sort of harken back to a period in the Earth's history when plants and animals were not such strong competitors with these mats, that the mats really were, were the primary producers in many coastal environments. Here's a slide now that shows a, a relevant scale for looking at what we call a stromatolite. And a stromatolite, it's a Greek, two words for layered rock. And these are just like you have tree rings on a, in a tree trunk or a branch. Here you have layers of microbial communities that have built up successively over seasons and years and so forth uh, to create this very characteristic fabric of, of laminations with what we call a crenulated type texture here. And that's a, that is basically the morphology, the fabric of a microbial mat community that is built up very analogous to the way in which a coral reef will build up layers, uh, but of course on a larger scale. And these are now, uh, this is actually a cross section through one of these mats uh, at Guerrero Negro, and the centimeter scale bar applies to both of these images. And you see the same crenulated texture, particularly in the shallow mats. The bottom line is that what we have here at Guerrero Negro is, a, is essentially a perfect analog, if not a homolog, of a, of a uh, hypersaline or, a, or a salty environment coastal environment uh, 1.3 billion years ago as recorded in this one group of rocks in Ontario. So these are really very close analogs and of course that's exactly what you want. You want a descendant of a community that has some real antiquity to it to try to get some insights as to the nature of that community. Uh, this is a real eye chart but it shows, it makes the point that this is a complete ecosystem and the other key point is that when you have an ecosystem where you not only have oxygen-dependent organisms, but also anaerobes, and that is organisms that can flourish in the absence of oxygen. You have, in many ways, a lot more diversity because there's a lot more interesting types of chemistry that can go on. So I like to liken this to the, an, as an analogy to a forest, where in the forest you have the canopy, namely the primary producers in the forest, it's the trees, and in these microbial biofilms, it's the cyanobacteria, 
or any other photosynthetic algae that has the ability to produce carbon just by using sunlight and then CO2 as a, as a carbon source. I want to just make the comment that we're talking millimeters here, okay, two, four, six millimeters. Within this very shallow zone, we have what we call functional groups. These are groups of organisms that are categorized with respect to their function, what it is they do with respect to processing carbon, processing energy, and so forth. And so the carbon then would flow from your canopy to the understory, just like in the forest, you have plants that live below the canopy, and they use wavelengths of light and inten light intensity that leaks through that canopy. And the same thing applies here. We have bacteria that are also phototrophic, meaning they're photosynthetic, but they have a very different, uh, di very, very different aspects to their metabolism from what the cyanobacteria do. The key thing is that they're photosynthetic, but they do not produce ox oxygen. Most forms of bacterial photosynthesis actually do not produce oxygen. Cyanobacteria really are the dominant group, are the group that does that. So these are understory organisms with respect to the light. The carbon sort of flows then down through other organisms that just process the carbon, fermentation, uh, oxic respiration, the organisms just like you and I who take in oxygen and burn organic matter for energy, that would be what we call the aerobic heterotrophs. Aerobic, they use oxygen heterotrophs, they're using organic matter as a, a source of electrons. And then, uh, because we're talking seawater here, we have the whole involvement of sulfur. Sulfur can be oxidized and reduced, and this creates uh, opportunities for a whole other host of different organisms that can either uh, use sulfate as an oxidant, just like we use oxygen, to burn organic matter and thereby get energy. Or they can use the, sulf the sulfide, the reduced sulfur, as a source of electrons, and these are the guys then that are photosynthetic, but then can use that sulfide as a source of reducing power to make organic matter. So you can see all these different strategies, and the key point is that they all work in concert in an ecosystem that really has some amazing characteristics that I'm going to get into. Just also want to point out that these color bars represent the wavelengths of light as they penetrate into the mat. The more infrared light goes further in than the shorter wavelengths, which are more easily scattered. The other key point is that between day and night, <laughs> we go from super saturated oxygen conditions within the top few millimeters of the mat to at nighttime where you drop into deep anoxia and hydrogen sulfide actually is a major constituent without much, within much of the mat. So you have organisms that really tolerate amazing extremes between light and dark, between super saturated oxygen and basically profoundly anaerobic conditions and these guys are just, they, do, they go through that every day. Uh, as part of their cycle. And also, for just understanding how the surface environment works, these, these mats are very important, be, or communities like them, because they, they process carbon, sulfur, and oxygen, and of course all that is very interactively involved with the system. As a consequence of all of that, we have some real effects on the, uh, on the environment, which I'll get into later in the talk, and they produce, these, or each of these organisms produce what we call biomarkers or biosignatures that in, if they can get into the geologic record will perhaps preserve at least some fraction or some aspect of this ecosystem. And of course, that's one of the places we really want to explore with this. Okay, this is the slide that takes the most words, but we've just gotten through it, so let's move on. Okay, now I just want to give you some visual impressions. Um, this is a scale of about two millimeters, and here's your, your canopy of the forest, the cyanobacteria, filamentous organisms. The light that comes down through that then is, is shared by other organisms that are, are use the wavelengths that are sort of left over by the cyanobacteria. And then right in here, there's, uh, the oxygen goes away even during the daytime, and it's profoundly anoxic below that. And of course, at that boundary, at that critical oxygen sulfide boundary, you have a whole host of organisms that are, have a characteristic all their own. And of course, then when you get into the anaerobic environment, yet again, a very characteristic group of organisms all within two to three millimeters of the surface of this mat. It's, it's really sort of the microbial an, uh, uh, analog of a, of a tropical rainforest. Here's just another example. Of the, and what I'm going to do, I'm going through this talk, I'm picking out studies that we've done over a period of some 20 years just to give you highlights about all the different ways you can study these ecosystems to gain more insight about the dynamics of it and therefore how the physiology of these organisms over geologic time might have adapted and, and, uh, to these conditions and, of course, to the changing conditions in, in the overall uh, global environment. So here we're looking at light intensity, and this is a log scale. So at the top, uh, 10 to the 2, that's 100% light of, of the instant light coming into the top of the mat. So that's what this scale is plotting. Uh, 
uh, <clears throat> this is depth going down here towards you, sort of three-dimensional plot, where this is the surface. And again, uh, in millimeters, in this case, two millimeters and four and six. So light intensity as a function of depth drops off. So you're seeing the light intensity decrease as you penetrate down into the mat. And then finally, the third dimension is the one of, of, of uh, wavelengths, short wavelengths through the visible range into the infrared. So here you see, first of all, that the short wavelengths drop off very quickly. Uh, these two green lines indicate the absorbance bands for chlorophyll A, which of course is the uh, key pigment for the cyanobacteria, your canopy species. And because they absorb that light, you can see it drops the, that those wavelengths drop off very quickly with depth, particularly where the cyanobacteria are the most abundant, uh, and uh, such that when you get down below them, the understory organisms are basically ones that harvest longer wavelengths of light. And indeed, that's the non-oxygen producing phototrophs that are sort of highlighted here. Uh, this shows where their chlorophylls absorb a lot of the light, and you can again see sort of a more profound drop off right in that wavelength range. So the amazing thing about these mats is that they have adapted, <clears throat> such as the stratification of organisms, uh, allows w different wavelengths of light to be allocated to different depths and different organisms within the community. And this, this wavelength allocation is a, is a very important structuring element in the, in the sort of the three-dimensional uh, architecture of these microbial mats. Again, all on, on a scale of hundreds of microns to just a few millimeters. So this, is a, this turns out to be a very important aspect, and it, it's, it's part of that story when I say that the interior environment of these mats is profoundly different from the surface. And it's a very important parameter in understanding the physiology of any one group of microbes that you would like to study within that mat. Just to give you another example of the dynamics, um, shown plotting several things here. Oxygen concentration is shown in the red lines, again, on a scale of just a few millimeters. And you can see you don't get very far in before the oxygen goes to zero and you have sulfide actually measurable within these mats. The very critical interface where oxygen and sulfide meet, and I keep saying critical because using oxygen to burn sulfide or to, to oxidize sulf sulfide is a very important energy source for a lot of microbes. You know, as I mentioned, the ones that use sulfide, uh, uh, sulfur species. The green bars represent rates of oxygen photosynthesis. So you have two kinds of oxygen parameters here. You have the amount of oxygen that's present, and you have the rate at which oxygen is being produced. And the key point I want to make here is that these two different microbial mats differ with respect to the depth relationship when, uh, where oxygen is produced versus the depths to which oxygen can penetrate. In one case, the oxygen production goes away uh, in a shallower depth than where oxygen can penetrate. In this case, this is telling you that the light is really not penetrating down to here. Uh, the, there's not, no longer enough, no, enough light for the cyanobacteria to do photosynthesis. And so down here, we have essentially darkness, oxygen, and sulfide. And that selects for a certain group of bacteria that can use oxygen and sulfide as an energy source, but they're not photosynthetic. In this case, we have evidence just from the rates of photos, oxygen photosynthesis that light is penetrating down into the zone where we do have sulfide present. So now we have sunlight penetrating into an anoxic zone, and this now gives a competitive advantage for the non-oxygen producing photosynthetic bacteria. And so we, in addition to making these measurements with little microelectrodes, we've, we've made uh, observations of the types of organisms that are present. This one's dominated by uh, phototrophs uh, that do not produce oxygen, and this is dominated by what we call chemotrophs, organisms that burn sulfide with oxygen as a source of energy. If for some reason the light could penetrate down to here in this mat, the oxygen producing guys would outcompete the, the chemotrophs because they can get their energy from sunlight, the chemotrophs can't, and in the competition for sulfide, the guys who can do photosynthesis will win out every time. So this is an example of just how the microenvironment in a very subtle way, uh, just how much the light can penetrate can profoundly affect the population of, of organisms within the mat. Um, another very important parameter is just how, how, how easy is it to, to exchange material or solutes dissolved in the overlying water column with what's in the mat. And a very key aspect of, of the fossil record of microbial mats is the morphology of that biofilm surface. The, the Soviet school of paleontology has actually started classifying these different morphologies of the stromatolites, call, giving them Latin names of genus and species, just totally based on the morphology 
of these films as they build up to make the stromatolites. Well, we have found that actually the, the, uh, the topography of the surface is in part driven by the, the rate of exchange of, of, of species between the overlying water and the mat as influenced by the rate at which these communities are operating. And so when you have a mat that's getting a lot of sunlight and it really wants to you know, get going with photosynthesis, it will modify its topography such that what we call something called the diffusion boundary layer uh, is minimized, especially at the peak. So we actually went in here and, and located the surface of the mat, and also using microelectrode methods, we located the top of what we call the diffusion boundary layer. And this is that stagnant film that's always on any surface. When you get really close to a solid surface, uh, you can almost, th there's no turbulence. It's really a, just a, a diffusional regime. And the importance of that is that the rates of diffusion re, uh, determine the rate at which something can get from the water column into the mat. And that is generally, as you can imagine, a much slower rate than if you could have turbulent mixing. So in the end, the diffusion boundary layer really determines how much of anything will get from the water column into the mat or vice versa. And so what these guys do, and they want to get more active, let's say under higher intensity of sunlight, they'll make these little peaks, which has the effect of, of minimizing the diffusion boundary layer over the, uh, over the pinnacles. And, and we can definitely correlate the mat morphology with, with the development of these, uh, and with the rates of photosynthesis, and, and clearly see that there's an adaptation which profoundly affects the morphology of, of these mats. Uh, and as a result of that, you can measure the rate of photosynthesis, just the sheer gross primary production, as a function of the intensity of the light. And we did this under two temperatures, and I don't want to get into this anymore to say that these mats are capable of maintaining very high rates of photosynthesis, even when you get up to light intensities that typically inhibit photosynthesis. In other words, these microbes, if you put them in a flask in the lab and irradiated them with sunlight, they would grow, uh, they would photosynthesize, but it's very soon as you increase the intensity, the, the light will actually inhibit the photosynthesis. But we do not observe that in inhibition in these mats, and all we can infer is that as the light intensity increases, you just go deeper into the mat and invoke activity in those organisms, but the overall productivity of the mat uh, continues to increase as you increase the light intensity. And why is this sort of interesting? Well, one of the reasons it's interesting is just this ecological reason. The second one is, is that these mats, within a few millimeters, can match the rate of photosynthesis of the most productive rainforests on the Earth or in the most productive coastal environments. No other ecosystem on Earth can exceed the rates of photosynthesis that we have measured in these mats, and they do it all within a few millimeters. Okay, and this is, an, it, this is just a beautiful example of the profound adaptation and evolution that has occurred to create these communities uh, and, and the very high rates of productivity that they can sustain. And as you know, you know, if you have a factory that's putting out a lot of products, uh, a key part of that production is how fast can you bring in the goodies to manufacture your product. And these mats are masters at recycling. You know, we have a lot to learn about recycling from these microbial mats, I can tell you, because uh, here's the oxygen production rate, here's the rate of several of these other processes that I alluded to later. And the important thing is that this package of processes is the one that's required to regenerate nutrients and just keep feeding the canopy organisms as fast as they can to maintain these very high rates of production. Sort of like decomposition of litter on the forest floor releases the nutrients back to the trees, which then can sustain production. The key point is that if you took any one of the organisms out of this ecosystem and put them in a test tube in a culture and changed the temperature, you would see a different rate of increase as, with increasing temperature for these different groups of organisms. You put them all together into this ecosystem and ramp up the temperature and it all goes up in concert. These things are so tightly coordinated with each other that even processes that would have dissimilar rates measured separately all change the same with temperature because of this profound interdependence of these groups within this microbial ecosystem. So it's just another example of the fine tuning that has occurred in order to do this. And here's a classic example of why this is important for understanding the physiology of these organisms. I, this, these are the same bars of oxygen production that I showed you earlier, and these are these red data points relate to the amount of oxygen that's present. The blue points represent what we call sulfate reduction, and these are the guys I mentioned who take sulfate and burn organic matter with a way, as a way of getting energy. A key thing, and this is an anaerobic process, you know, this does not happen, you know, this is, 
does not depend on oxygen. But also, this is, if you take those organisms out and put them in a flask and, and try to get them to do their sulfate reduction thing, if, you, if there's any oxygen around, they won't do it. It shuts down the system. Ox, a sulf, microbial sulfate reduction is poisoned by the presence of molecular oxygen, and it's because it attacks the particular molecules that are doing the reduction process. However, we have measured the highest rates of sulfate reduction ever measured in nature in the presence of supersaturated oxygen within these mats. Something is going on within these microbial mats that allows the highest rates ever measure, measured in nature of sulfate reduction in the presence of supersaturated oxygen. Tell me if that isn't a way of nature informing you that you don't know what the heck's going on. <laughs> and it's critically important that, that it be an intact ecosystem for this phenomenon to be expressed. So we're getting some insights as to what's going on here, but it's just another example of the importance of studying these, these organisms physiology in, within the intact ecosystem. I want to talk a little bit about the sheer abundance of organisms there and, and also the other importance of these studies. Here's the so-called canopy organism, cyanobacteria here, and you can see the scale bar of 20 <laughs> microns. And I love this fluorescence image, but it was done by Ruth Lay because here is a whole you know, forest, a whole you know, rainforest type of, of, of diversity of organisms that are very much clustered around that primary producer uh, delivering nutrients, benefiting from the organic carbon that it's producing, all part of this very tight system on scales of just tens of microns. So I, I, like, I sort of liken this image to like the city lights. You out, you're looking out at this huge city and you know all these different tradespeople are there doing their thing and they're all interacting with each other and you can see they all have their little lights or whatever. In this case, these guys are all fluorescing. But it really is a reasonable analogy. There's a huge um, diversity that you just see within this image here. So who, who's there anyway? Well, I don't want to get into this in detail, but the, basically the canopy organisms are plotted up here, and all these other things are just the various groups of organisms that actually collectively constitute what we call the bacterial kingdom of life. I'm sure you've heard talks about the three domains of life, the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukarya. Uh, this, this is a listing of the major subgroups within the bacteria, and so it pretty much captures the major part of the bacterial tree of life. And just, we're just mapping out the various, the abundances of all these organisms. But this, the only point I'm really gonna make with this, besides saying that there's an enormous diversity here, is that we have discovered several major new groups, subgroups within these mats that were not known to science before that. This makes another key point about these microbial mats that have been around for a long time. It's just like people going into the rainforest and finding whole species or genuses of things that we have never known before we are actively discovering major groups of organisms that had never been known before. It's not surprising because a lot of these things cannot grow in pure culture. They can only grow in the community. Again, underscoring the, underscoring the importance of the community interactions. But the point is, this is a wonderful hunting grounds for getting a much bigger understanding of the diversity of life and therefore the antiquity of some of these very important lineages. And we're just beginning to peek into that big dark room. And part of the ways of peeking in there is to generate fluorescent probes for different groups of organisms, which then allow you to pick out who, are, who they are and where they are within the mat. Again, we're talking about going vertically down through the mat, the photosynthetic zone up in here, going down through that critical zone I talked about where the oxygen meets the sulfur. But now what you're doing is you're seeing fluorescence based on the types of organisms. The guys who have photosynthetic pigments and therefore they're photosynthetic are showing up red here. If they're cyanobacteria, they there's another thing that's flourishing that actually gives them this sort of reddish, um, sort of purplish color. But this is the sulfate reducing bacteria that I talked about earlier, these guys who use sulfate to burn organic matter as a source of energy. The key point here is that we're seeing different shapes of these guys, and we can see the shapes because they're fluorescing, these little cells are fluorescing. And this, the, the groups of the populations of these guys are changing as we go from the area that's oxygenated. These are the exciting ones that are going to do that high rate of sulfate reduction in the presence of oxygen down through this transition zone and into the profoundly anaerobic zone. And all I just want to say now is that we're beginning to identify where in the mat these different groups of just the sulfate reducing bacteria are living. So we're beginning now to put in a golden spike between identifying who's there and identifying what they're doing, okay? And this is a key thing. Who's there, what are they doing, and what place is within the mat? I mean, this is the same thing you do if you go out into a forest trying to figure out plant-animal relationships. We are now getting, having the molecular techniques to do this at the microscale within these microbial communities.
And again, these are just some beautiful images Victoria Orphan made these of particular types of uh, methane producing organisms. Uh, Methanosarsenales is one group. So we're also now getting into methanogens. This is now getting into the more profoundly anaerobic part of the, of the uh, microbial mat community. And I just, this is just a quick slide to, sh to show you that um, we're also even looking at eukarya, and that is the, the organisms that are uh, living within the mat that are, that are the ancestors or closely related to plants and animals. Only many of these are single-celled organisms, although there are some who are obviously multi-celled. There's a lot of nematodes in there. These little guys that in the soils can sometimes be nasty pathogens for plants, but the nematode group is an enormously diverse group, and most of them are harmless. A lot of those in there, uh, we even have fly larvae, I think, hanging out in the area, some arthropods. Flies like to have their larvae consuming these mats. This makes a key point, is that for billions of years, these, have been a, these things have been a great food source. And there's a lot of reason to suspect that the animal lineage, which is probably 1.3 billion years or older, and for half of its existence was single-celled, and then this miracle happened about 600 million years ago, that these guys may have, that whole lineage may have emerged in microbial mats. And why do you say that? Well, that's a great place to eat, you know? I mean, no better place to sort of develop and diversify than a, in, a, in a community like this that's a great food source. And so it could well be that the origins of, of plants and animals, or animals as we know them, could well be something that lived long ago in one of these microbial mats. This again makes the point that we're making new discoveries, a whole new group of eukaryotes? Geez, don't we know about all the plants and animals that are there? Well, maybe, but not all the single-celled organisms that are in that same group. Again, making more discoveries of those as well. So, uh, and this is the root, uh, work in, coming out of uh, University of Colorado, um, Fiesel et al. So anyway, we're, we're not just looking at the bacteria, we're looking at the archaea. And of course, the biosignatures. Um, this is where I'd sort of like to move to next. Uh, you probably have had talks before about fossil, different types of fossils, and particularly microbial fossils. But of course, we have the cellular fossils or the body fossils in the case of a higher organism. They're, they're sort of morphologic type fossils. But also, and as I sh talked about earlier, we have these community type fossils, which are the stromatolites, formed by layers of biofilms accreting up in a very characteristic fashion to tell you that this was basically a microbial reef, a microbial community that, that could make you know, these hard deposits. We also have certain uh, minerals and the magnetite made famous by the whole Allen Hills meteorite thing uh, produced by some organisms. Stable isotope patterns, which I just, it's a lot of what I've done, but I just don't have time to get into, indicating here's organic matter, here's carbonate carbon, with each having different ratios of carbon 13 to carbon 12, a difference that becomes characteristic of the, the carbon fixation of these organisms going back billions of years in time, as indicated there. And then, of course, characteristic organic molecules that can become signatures for particular groups of organisms. And if you can infer some of the functions of these, of these compounds, then that helps you infer the, a function that might have been present in that fossil deposit. So these are all the different categories of biosignatures, organic, uh, morphologic, uh, mineralogic, and, and isotopic. And of course, the, one of the big challenges in astrobiology is not so much to identify a feature that could be made by life, but to identify a feature that could be made by life that has a, is highly improbable to be formed by a non-biologic process. So the true value of a biosignature as an indicator of life in a, in a geologic deposit is more that non-biological processes cannot produce it than the case that the biological uh, source could, could produce it. And so, the big challenge is to anything you observe in an old rock, it starts out being probably ambiguous, and your task is to decide whether that is truly a biosignature. It can only be made by life, or whether it, uh, or, or, or whether it could also be made by, by non-life. And then, of course, there's other features that can only be made. Whoops, I got it backwards. Uh, this only made by life on this side, only made by other processes. But this zone of ambiguity is the real challenge that we face in this business with biosignatures. I'll just start off by saying just that texture I showed you earlier uh, is, a, is a biosignature in detail, and so therefore we can infer a biological origin here, especially when you look closely within here and see evidence of flexibility such as you would get with an organic biofilm. What we learned in our studies in, in our mats that with just within a few years, a lot of the very characteristic features 
that we see in some very well-preserved stromatolites are already erased in this modern community. What that tells us is that this community that grew 1.35 billion years ago almost got entombed within months of when that biofilm formed. In other words, to preserve some of these fine details based on our studies today, uh, there must have been a mineral phase that went in there and literally froze everything and preserved it, uh, preventing bacteria from breaking it down as, as we see in our microbial mats today, uh, just in a matter of a few years. So this gives an insight about the kind of preservation process required and therefore the environmental conditions required, like the saturation of things in the water there, to uh, preserve the features of this kind of exquisite detail. So just we not only understand what a biosignature is by looking at the modern mat, we also understand the processes that can destroy biosignatures and then infer by what we see in the record how uh, quickly they must have been preserved and fossilized. So this is a very important insight about the types of environments that are the best for preserving biosignatures. And that turns out to be an important consideration, not just for the early Earth, but for where we go to look for evidence of life on Mars. This is another eye chart, and I'll just allude to the fact that you have these different groups of organisms, again, these functional groups as I talked about, and Linda Janke at Ames, uh, working with others in our group, has begun to identify in much more detail all the different types of organic compounds that are very characteristic of particular functional groups. So this is now the beginning of our Rosetta Stone, where we're looking at the modern community, identifying who's there, identifying what they make, that could then in some way be preserved in the record so that if we go back into an ancient rock and see the same compounds, we can go back to our Rosetta Stone and say, oh my gosh, you know, chemolithotroph from this group is pre was present or a methane producing organism was present and so forth. And so this is a very long-term, very ambitious thing, but the organic, the, the power of organic structures, particularly large ones, to preserve a lot of information is just incredible but the effort to really calibrate that record and understand it is also quite an effort. Again, another R chart. I just don't want to get into too much detail because I'm trying to keep it at the overview level. But one of the things we discovered is that as you go deeper in the mat and you get further away from that primary production, that canopy that makes for such a rich community, the diversity really starts to narrow down. And this is important because now as we look as a function of depth into the mat, we're looking at the survivorship of all the kinds of features that we would love to find you know, in, in the ancient record. And so the very critical question is, at what point, as this microbial mat is being buried and decomposed, do you bring in the minerals and preserve it? And whatever, whenever that preservation happens, that's the snapshot you're going to get. It may not be the snapshot right at the top where you have all that wonderful diversity. It's a snapshot of of where you were at the time that the minerals came in and preserved that record. And so by looking as a function of depth in these mats and seeing just what's better preserved than something else and who survives better than others, uh, we're, we're getting more of a clarification of the extent to which the preservation process has biased what we see in the record relative to what was actually there. So it's a thing called taphonomy, the study of the relationship between the living organism and the fossil that would be preserved. All the processes that sort of link that organism to the fossil that emerges are very important for interpreting what that fossil is really telling you and being honest about what you can't infer from that because of the, any degradation that might have occurred. Probably one of the most profound things we discovered that as you go down within the mat, the population of bacteria drops profoundly compared to the populations of archaea, that other major group of, of life. And so therefore, depending on when it was that that got preserved as a function of depth within the mat, uh, you're, you're getting a skewed representation of what that bacterial to archaea uh, ratio was near the surface of the mat. So it's very important to make an assessment of preservation in this. A whole bunch of other things down here, which basically speak to the fact that we're now beginning to look at the methane producers as a function of depth and produce and the kinds of uh, uh, preservable organic compounds that they make to cross-calibrate now uh, what <coughs> compounds relate to which types of methane producers and therefore what part of this ecosystem we're, we're seeing when we find that particular molecule. So we're sort of, again, calibrating the populations of organisms to the organic compounds that have good potential for being preserved. And that's a lot of what this is about. The other comment in here is that the different types of methanogens at different depths are indicating different types of ecological relationships at different depths. 
And we're now beginning to understand this in the context of the types of organic substrates that these different groups of methane producers use. And again, another understanding of this dimension of, of this interaction between the various groups of organisms. So we're really beginning to move now into linking populations with the processes that are going on at various steps. And of course, ultimately to the products that could be preserved in the record and interpreted. Uh, just to show you some colorful pictures here, this is a cyanobacterial layer here. These are these purple uh, non-oxygen producing phototrophs that are living below the cyanobacteria. And he, you can even see them in this rock here. The, the brighter light is the one that the cyanos uh, is using and then the light that gets through to the inner group here is those are the wavelengths of light that the uh, non-oxygen producing phototrophs uh, uh, can use. And of course the different colors reflect the adaptation of the pigments to harvesting those different wavelengths of light. And so this is just a colorful example of the sharing of light by the different organisms. And again, another eye chart, but again to say that we're mapping the relative populations of all these photosynthetic organisms as a function of depth within these gypsum type deposits, these more translucent mineral deposits. Again, to, uh, to document in a gypsum depositing environment uh, how the various types of photosynthetic, or, or photosynthetic organisms change as a function of depth. So I, again, I don't want to get into the details. And then mapping those different uh, organisms and layers that we see, those different colors, the orange one you saw and then that purple one, mapping the actual organic compounds that are present there as surrogates for, um, for the various populations of phototrophs that are there. So this is all down in the weeds here, but it's all part of this in, a very important effort to, to understand the relationship between who's there and what they're producing that we could then potentially see preserved and then retrieved in, in, in an analysis of an ancient sediment. And again, on and on, Linda Janke has also figured out how to use fatty acids to measure the amount of living biomass as a function of depth. And this very key capability now uh, has allowed her to uh, understand the, the relative survivorship of these organisms as you go deeper within the mat, both with a, a perspective on understanding what might be preserved in rocks, but also with a perspective on just understanding the dynamics of what's going on within these mats. By using fatty acids that are very common in the membranes of these organisms, she's shown that that there's a very nice quantitative relationship between the abundance of these fatty acids and the, the amount of, of biomass, cellular biomass of these different groups of organisms. On and on, a lot of stuff. Okay, I'm gonna change subject away from the organic films and just talk about a consequence of the incredible high productivity of these mats in the context of how the atmosphere of the Earth has changed over time. As you probably have had talks here in the past about how the early Earth was probably oxygen free or very low levels of oxygen and then at some point, perhaps between 2.5 and 1.8 billion years ago, we saw a real increase in the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere. And then perhaps as we move towards the Phanerozoic, towards the age of plant and animals becoming more prominent, perhaps another kick up of oxygen. And Andy Knoll at Harvard has hypothesized that, that the, the timing of the evolution of plants, multicellular plants and animals may well be related to this, this timing of the rise of oxygen because plants and animals are, you know, are very strongly dependent on the abundance of oxygen and therefore anything in the ecosystem or the global environment that would have, would have determined the levels of oxygen could have been very important for determining the timing of the advent of these organisms. So from a biosphere point of view, understanding the budget that influences atmospheric oxygen is a very important parameter. And we people have been arguing lustily for decades about the mechanisms that might be involved in the timing of those rises. And that, of course, is a whole year's worth of argument right there that one could get into. But one of the things we found, which is very interesting, was that because these microbial mats are very productive, right at the surface, between the sediment surface and the water column, because they tend to populate coastal environments, and we have good reason to believe that earlier in Earth history we had what we call much more extensive epicontinental seas. These are very shallow seas where sunlight reaches the bottom of the, the, the sediment surface. The best example today is the Baham Bahamian platform, where you basically have sunlight penetrating all the way down to that carbonate platform out in the Caribbean. Uh, so the key point is, is that, you know, uh, two, three billion years ago, the geologic evidence would indicate that these things were very pervasive uh, and that uh, they were obviously photosynthetic. What we found, uh, and this is just looking at one of these mats again as a function of the time of day where this color here represents daylight and this color represents darkness, 
Here you see the, 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 uh, the light impinging upon the mat. Okay, so this is obviously the period where the photo rates of photosynthesis are very high. What Tori Holler at Ames did was measure the hydrogen that's, that's present within the mat. And the interesting thing is that if the photosynthesis rate is very high, there's not enough carbon around uh, to, to reduce. There's not enough CO2 around in order to reduce to organic matter. So what, and, and of course, the photosynthesis is splitting water and producing a, a, a protonate, a, a hydrogen-bearing comp compound. And what it wants to do is take that hydrogen-bearing compound over to another group of reactions and stick it on CO2 to make organic matter. But if there's not enough CO2 around, what happens is that it produces hydrogen. So I've got to get rid of this hydrogen somehow, so it starts making hydrogen gas. The significance of that is that the rate at which it does that in these mats is 7% of, of the gross production of the mat. Now, 7% doesn't sound like it's very close to 100%, but this 7% is much larger than the rate at which, these, uh, in which the Earth as, a, as an entire biosphere is burying organic carbon in sediments. Uh, and, and I'll get into the significance of that in a minute. So there's, and especially at nighttime, uh, the rate at which, these are, these are rates at which hydrogen is actually coming out of the mats. So once you get rid of that pesky oxygen in the daytime because of the photosynthesis, the, just the processes within the mat release enormous amounts of hydrogen into the water, overlying water column. And the important point is that once that hydrogen gets into the overlying water column and gets diluted, uh, it's not, it doesn't get reuptaked by the mat. Hydrogen, everybody loves hydrogen. What are the units? Uh, these are uh, Pascals, so it's a pr measure of pressure that he's measuring uh, within the mat and then uh, measuring in the headspace over the mat. But it, you know, and these, this, is the, this is an order, these are, this is a log scale here. So you can see how the rate at which hydrogen escaping into the overlying atmosphere of the mat goes up by orders of magnitude at nighttime once you remove oxygen as a sink. The important point is that way back when oxygen first started to develop on the Earth, and it's probably at least 2.5 billion years ago, obviously there wasn't much oxygen in the atmosphere. Okay, so any hydrogen that could get out of the mat into the atmosphere we, uh, some people have calculated, would have a re atmospheric residence time on the order of a thousand years. Whereas back in those days, any oxygen that would escape into the atmosphere would have a residence time of hours. So the interesting twist here is that today, hydrogen has a residence time of minutes to hours in the atmosphere. Oxygen has a residence time of 8,000 years. But back in this environment, hydrogen would have had a residence time of a thousand years in the atmosphere and, and oxygen would be just consumed very quickly. The key point is that this hydrogen can escape to space. You know, with that kind of residence time, it could, it could convect up into the stratosphere and further up and actually be lost to space. And so you're producing, you're delivering, this today you're delivering 7% of gross primary production into the atmosphere as hydrogen uh, with the potential if that hydrogen has a decent residence time in the atmosphere, it could be lost to space. And so there's this interesting scenario. When oxygen photosynthesis first developed, you have these little oxygen oases, you know, places where it's being produced, but once that oxygen steps out of that oasis, it's, 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 uh, it's reacted away by all these reduced compounds that you see in the environment. And so here we have then hydrogen and, and even methane with, that would last in the atmosphere with lifetimes of hundreds to thousands of years, whereas oxygen is a trace constituent because it's constantly being destroyed by volcanic activity, sulfides, reduced iron, and all that kind of thing. This then would support a hydrogen loss to space, which if you allow this to go on for 100 million years, you could literally switch the atmosphere over to an oxygenated atmosphere. The key thing in understanding how did our atmosphere go from being profoundly anoxic to being oxic is to understand how you could have a net loss from the entire system of reduced material. Okay, it's not good enough just to take something and bury it in the sediments because a a few tens of millions of years later, that's going to get weathered again and it's going to come back. To have a unidirectional profound change in the atmospheric oxidation state, you need to have a permanent net loss of reduced material. And I can't think of a better way than throwing it out in space and letting the solar winds sweep it away from the Earth. So we again enter the argument with everybody else as to what actually happened uh, to cause our atmosphere to transition from anoxic to oxic. But I contend that this, as in terms of it's sort of like solving the energy crisis, you need several solutions. And perhaps this is one of the solutions to understanding how we'd made that unidirectional, irreversible transition in the Earth's atmosphere. So the, the very high productivity of these organisms, their proximity to the atmosphere where they could 
deliver these reductants to the atmosphere that then some of which could get lost. The, the methane would disassociate and the hydrogen from that would then get lost. Uh, could be a very important understanding the long-term evolution. And of course, I just want to finish with a couple of slides here talking about just the role that single-celled organisms play in, on the Earth with respect to the antiquity of the biosphere. Clearly, as you go back in time, going back this way, you're in a period where you, the whole biosphere is, is totally unicellular life. So obviously, it's very important to understand our origins. Here we are coming along later and in a much ra narrower range of environmental conditions than what single cell organisms. And this just sort of underscores that. We see microbes deeper in the Earth's crust than, of course, plants and animals can penetrate. But there's this nasty, frustrating problem that, the, as I said at the beginning of my talk, that the geologic record only extends back to about 3.7 to 3.8 billion years ago. And we have this gap where the origin of life happened. These are all these processes that could have given organic matter to the prebiotic environment, but we don't have any record of it. It's very frustrating. And of course, it's for that reason that we're very interested in going to Mars. Because we now can tell from what we've observed on Mars that in these very early periods, which we call the Noachian and the Hesperian, prior to 3 billion years, perhaps prior to 3.8 billion years ago, that we do have well-preserved crust. So because Mars is less geologically active than the Earth, it's been less aggressive at destroying that earliest record of its environment. And as you've probably heard in several talks here, the, the remote orbital remote sensing of Mars has identified a whole variety of environments in which liquid water played an active role. So now we have this embarrassment of riches where there's all these different places we can go that had water. Which one do you send your next rover to? I mean, everybody can make a cogent argument for going to here, going to there, and so forth. What I just want to do is underscore that in the case of certain plain sediments where we see deposits that were evaporating, could come from evaporating water. Uh, here we also have sulfates analogous to yeah, clays and sulfates here. There are environments that are in, in some ways analogous to the coastal environment that we studied in Mexico where seawater gets very concentrated and has the ability to deposit minerals. And of course the minerals are very good for preserving anything that's there. And what's sort of exciting Here's a, here's a rock that we ground into with um, Opportunity Rover some years ago. And these scale bars are the same. You know, that's like a centimeter or so. That's the scale bar for what I showed you earlier in my talk. We now have the ability in Mars to roll up to a deposit that was in water and to observe it at a scale that is very relevant for just potentially finding fabrics in stromatolytic type deposits. So already we have on Mars the, at least the visual capability of finding microbial textures. And of course now with the Curiosity rover, we have a mass spectrometer which has the ability to detect organic matter within those deposits. So we are now just on the verge in Mars exploration of getting into an exploration where we can really look for evidence of life. And I would argue that these, mi these microbial biofilms that are so diverse, they're so robust with respect to the environments they live in, and they have this ability to preserve records of their, of their composition are prime examples of the types of communities that we should look for as we look on Mars. And of course, with the insights that we gain about early biological evolution on the Earth, any such thing that we might find on Mars would uh, give us some real insight as to whether that was a separate biosphere from the get-go or that somehow we have some common ancestry or whatever. But in any case, this, is, this whole study that I just presented to you is an example of the types of candidates that we try to identify to guide our exploration of the search for potentially a second ev uh, example of life in our solar system. And with that, thanks to the group uh, of really dozens of people who have contributed to the research I, I talked about today and, of course, to the various funding sources for this research program. Thank you. Dave, you've, um, you, you talked in your first slide about the uh, hypersaline environments of today's microbial mats. Um, has there been any research into uh, acidification in the ocean and, and, and how that might affect microbial mats, such as the ones that uh, you pointed out? Yeah, the, acid the, the biggest problem is front and center with acidification is for organisms that have calcareous skeletons or, or shells or whatever. Uh, in fact, I just heard a talk a few days ago by Greg Rao at Ames <laughs> talking about different groups of calcareous organisms and their sensitivity to changes in the degree of saturation or supersaturation of carbonate. The seawater is about three times supersaturated with respect to uh, 
calcium carbonate. Uh, but if you drop that down to just one, you know, a, a couple of times supersaturated, already some groups of organisms are in jeopardy. So uh, multicellular organisms that have calcareous skeletons are the ones that are really in, in jeopardy here. Uh, with respect to microbial mats, uh, I talked a lot about a marine hypersaline environment where the pH is in the order of eight and get, gets up to nine in the mats during photosynthesis during the daytime. But I could have easily also talked about Yellowstone National Park where you see microbial mats living at much lower pHs. And so I guess my answer to you is that the effect of an acidification is that you would just swap out some community members for another. This is a key point actually I wanted to make is that those different functional groups I showed you, like the canopy organisms and the consumers and sulfur guys, um, if you change the conditions, you'll still have that structure. You'll just swap out membership. Okay, and that's sort of what we mean by a functional. In fact, this is part of the reason these mats are so diverse. They not only have all those different functional groups, but within each of those boxes is a whole host of organisms that are adapted to different environmental conditions. So if you change the conditions, you'll just swap out the membership and uh, life goes on. So mats are, as a community, are very robust at the micro scale when you're talking about one organism versus another. Yeah, you may swap one out for the other. But uh, the, the interesting thing we're also finding about the ocean and even about these mats is that there's a, an incredible diversity of organisms that have very low abundance that are sort of hanging back. They're literally orders of magnitude less abundance than the major players that I was talking about. If you change conditions, these guys step forward. So that's a robustness that uh, you, know, you just don't see parallel to in, as much in plants and animals. Yeah, you got, they got a deep bench, right, thanks. Yeah, they. David, could you expand a little bit more on the oxygenation history of the Earth's atmosphere? You talk about an important process, loss of hydrogen, but isn't it episodic? Doesn't it come up and down and go into plateaus and then increase again? That's right, and uh, one good reason to believe why that's episodic <coughs> is plate tectonics and the effect that that has on continental configurations and the effect that those configurations have on the coastal environments. So in the, in the Phanerozoic, we have two extreme examples, I guess the Cretaceous 100 million years ago, where let's say, uh, you know, 40% of the 48 states in the U.S. are under in epicontinental seas, sort of a, an inland sea that came right up from in along the Mississippi River basin and, and pretty much covered the interior of the U.S. And then you go back to the Permian, which are Permian-Triassic period, which of course, as you might know, is the age of big extinction. That was where all the continents were squished together in this thing called Pan, um, Pangaea. And uh, the Panthalassic Ocean occupied 270 degrees of longitude, a big continuous ocean. But the trouble with cramming all those continents together is that you now expand the volume of the ocean basins, the seawater drops off the continental shelves, and you suddenly now put the coastal ecosystems under great stress. Okay, so the, my point here is that the effects to, the extent to which continents moving around and geography changing over time affects the different habitats and the aerial extent of these different habitats. All you have to do is take a next step to say, well, if a microbial mat habitat depends on shallow seas and suddenly now you've cut the abundance of shallow seas down by a factor of two or three in aerial extent, this could affect the overall budget of things. And so I think the, the sort of modulation of a long-term trend uh, could easily be achieved by just the effects that tectonics have on, on the continents and, and, and their geography. So, um, and, and this, of course, is another area of active investigation. During this period when oxygen has changed so much now, people are beginning to, to drill in any which way they can to say, well, what, what were the continent locations? You know, what are all the pieces of this puzzle that may probably do factor in in some way in understanding the nature of the change in oxygen? Yeah. Yeah, one of the parts of this puzzle I've been most interested in has been the bootstrapping of this. And basically the abstract mathematics involved with the, the, a formation of a film or a mat. Mm -hmm. And in particular with looking at catalysts. Catalysts have certain structures with, which mathematically we can uh, look at as going between 2D to slightly more than 2D, what we call fractal uh, uh, geometries of nature. And now, by catalyst, you're talking about an or a molecule? Like I can an talk enzyme about or? organic and, uh, and uh, uh, inorganic catalyst. I can talk about catalyst in the form of organic molecules or even uh, active zones on uh, uh, proteins, for example. So I'm right. talking about a very low scale. So if you think about this, you, the thinnest possible films, 
will also be the most unstable ones. And you would imagine that in areas of where extremophiles are found, the thin films uh, should be the ones that you watch for great change or the bootstrapping <coughs> effect to begin with. Has anybody studied very thin biofilms as, as sort of the bootstrap effect, possibly a leading edge effect of life uh, uh, or things that lead, uh, you know, proto-life? Uh, well, of course, th the one big advantage of the biofilm is that, you know, you're talking about a solid substrate, you're talking about a stability of that ecosystem just by virtue of the stability of the substrate that it's sitting on. I can show you great examples of stromatolites fabrics growing up and the ones that grow fastest are the ones that are sitting on nice solid rock as opposed to something that's sitting on a sediment which has an instability. So just to be a biofilm, you know, is a big step right there. Now the thin biofilms, when, when you were saying that, the first thing I could think of is a pioneering biofilm. Let's say for some reason you've had a turbulent event and you clean off a surface. Obviously you start with the film being very thin. When I first started getting into this stuff a few decades ago, I was trying to grow these things up in a greenhouse. And what I found is that, you know, the growth would, would on a substrate, you know, sunlight and all that, providing all the goodies, would be very slow, very slow for a while. Maybe it's analogous to your thin biofilm that's just, uh, just trying to get its act together. And, but obviously the, the accretion is heterogeneous. Some places are more than, and once I got to a certain thickness, suddenly the productivity just takes off. And of course, in the context of this talk, I would say, well, you know, you got the whole community now, you're getting the feedback loops, you're regenerating the nutrients. And uh, then I would, once I forgot to do anything with them for a month, and so they fell onto hard times. And the thin biofilms were abandoned, and all these organisms migrated to these places where the biofilms were thick. So I have this kind of anecdotal information that's consistent with what you just said. Uh, but you're drilling deeper. You want to say people getting into the molecular, you know, have they really gotten into what some of the chemical functionality is that's going on, and I'm not aware of it. Um, there's an engineering department, I'm trying to remember the guy's name, up at uh, Stanford. Um, can't remember his name right now. He, he may be getting into this kind of stuff, because he's looking at, like, uh, Shuanella films. And he's really getting down at the level where uh, that, that, that's appropriate to really get at what you're saying at sort of that in, uh, catalyst level. Um, we, there was a meeting once where a bunch of us talking about these horribly complex ecosystems would give our talk, and of course our claim to fame was the importance of understanding them, but they're incredibly complex. You know, we're just peeking into big dark rooms. And then the other group that was invited were the people who study symbio symbioses between two organisms. So it's, it's this whole game of how to, what goes on between a, in a community. The simplest community is a symbiotic one where you have a host and a, and a symbiont. And they get into all these profound things that they've learned about what's going on just with these two organisms interacting. So in the same meeting, you have these people who are getting at the level that you're talking about. We're getting down to the real molecular details. But it's just this little symbiotic community. And then we have us working on these profound things, and we don't know what the heck's going on because it's so complicated. And the trick is to close this gap. Oh, that's the fractal part? That's the point of doing this in the first place. Uh, okay. Because it is simply if you have a seed and a successive function, so to speak, right. you can't predict a fractal growth. Well, that, that's very profound, and, but I just, I'm not aware of anybody who's sort of following that. That's nice. Yeah, I've got a question here. <clears throat> is the very, very earliest life photosynthetic? Uh, these fossils I showed you at 3.4, I think demonstrably photosynthetic, but to answer your question, I have to appeal to the part of the, rec the, the geologic record that we don't have. And of course, this is another motivation, for, this is, <laughs> but this is the motivation for studying these mats, because as you, as you probably have heard in these lectures, you have the geologic record of early life, and then you have the living record of early life, you know, just like studying DNA sequences, uh, RNA sequences to identify the three domains of life and to understand ancestries and all of that. I think the answer to your question could well be uh, achieved by doing these very detailed studies of the different molecular systems, particularly ones surrounding the photosynthetic process. Um, there's a, some people think that, that chlorophyll-based photosynthesis might have originated in a, what was it, nitri what was it nitrogen fixation organisms? There's a lot of common machinery there, such as indicating that possibly there was a gene duplication event and that the, one of those things continued to do the nitrogen thing, but the other one may have led towards the development of photosynthesis. 
it's this, these types of ancestral relationships that <laughs> would address the question well, you have. The, the earliest life doesn't necessarily have to be photo, uh, chlorophyll based. Chlorophyll right. Based. That's and that's yeah. That's another valid point, of course. But you know, that's that's even a harder one to address. <laughs> I, I picked the low-hanging fruit there, the origin of chlorophyll-based photosynthesis. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so let's talk about Mars again for a minute. Sure. Uh, it's been in the news recently this theory that maybe life developed on Mars before it developed on Earth. And, you know, the big meteor strikes, floats around in space, preserved, lands on Earth, and, and thrives. But from what you're saying, it sounds to me like such a scenario is much more likely to be successful if it was a whole mat from Mars or a whole community from Mars rather mm -hmm. than just like, well, a bunch of microbes on Mars now are a bunch of microbes on Earth, right? Mm -hmm. So how would we go about, you know, even beginning to look at like Martian meteorites, not like, you know, that one meteorite that you alluded to where it's like, oh, well, here's an example, but maybe a biosignature from one kind of organism. Right. Wouldn't we expect to see a biosignature from a whole diff diverse community? if it were that kind of a, a smoking gun meteor? Right, yeah, actually, you allow, that, this allows me to make a pitch for sample return from Mars. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, the, and the reason is, is that uh, we didn't get to pick the Mars meteorites that, we, sure. that came to the Earth. <laughs> and uh, there is some kind of a preservational bias, isn't it? I mean, what we see on the Earth, coming to Earth, is not what we now figure is pretty much the dense abundance of various types of rocks on the surface of Mars. It should come as no surprise that the toughest rocks are the ones that are the best re represented in, in, the, in the collection. Uh, so that's, that's the problem, that's the challenge with the Mars meteorite thing. A lot of what we see <coughs> in a Mars meteorite that might be relevant is some kind of subsurface life that maybe lived in fractures or something that somehow then was delivered intact to the Earth. <coughs> but um, Jay Malosh, the, the guy who does the dynamics of impacts, the idea is that when an impact, impact goes in, <clears throat> you, there's this donut right around the, the hole of the donuts where the impactor went in and that, uh, the annulus around that hole literally gets launched straight up and out without experiencing a big pressure gradient, especially the stuff near the surface. Well, the photosynthetic organisms are the ones near the surface. So you could envision where a, a nice you know, donut-shaped mass of stuff could be literally launched off Mars like a rocket, basically. Um, at right around that impact. Now, when you get further away from the entry point, then, you, then things get nasty because all that energy is coming back out and a lot of heating and pressure gradients. Anyway, so the point is I, I could conceive where you could get that launched off. Um, yeah, I think that um, you know, the, a, a community has a better chance of surviving, especially if it's in a three-dimensional structure. Of course, this is all speculation. I mean, we just, we just don't know. Um, I don't know what, what did I really answer your question? Or did I, just I think it's best it can be answered right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, we, don't have the right rocks. it's, we don't have the right rocks. It's possible. And of course, the case for sample return is that the, we get the samples back, but we get to pick which ones. And based on this and other perspectives, you know, that can really inform what rocks we get to bring back. Yeah. Uh, my question's about carbon-13, carbon-12 ratios. My daughter does uh, research on methane emission from melting permafrost, and okay. apparently the carbon-13, carbon-12 ratios in that methane say a lot about the methanogens and the other organisms that produce it. Right. My question is about, does this ratio represent a good life signature for, for, for margin exploration? Yeah, in principle it does, and it allows me to do a little pitch about all the carbon cycle work I've done. On the Earth, uh, well, the key point is, is that to understand the isotopic composition of something like the methane, it takes on significance when you know what the general substrate was that the organism worked on. Because really the signature, isotopic signature, is, is, a, is, is a difference. A difference in the abundance of the C13, C12 ratio in the methane versus, you know, the... the yeah, where it got its stuff from. Uh, we've really been spoiled on the Earth because we've had this wonderful thing called an ocean that has pretty much been here since 4.4 billion years ago. And it's got a lot of solutes in it, specifically bicarbonate. And the, the carbonate rocks that we can analyze can be directly related to what the isotopic composition of that seawater carbonate, bicarbonate was. So we have a really nice, well-preserved record, a standard, to which we can then compare the organic matter or any trapped methane, we can compare it to that. We don't have that on Mars. Um, I think one of the key objectives on Mars is what are the major carbon reservoirs in the crust? What are their isotopic compositions? 
can we even play the kind of carbon isotope game on Mars that we can on the Earth, given that we need the, to understand these relationships? Yeah. The bigger, yeah, we need to, the con, sort of the context of where the big reservoirs are, what their abundances are, and then we can begin to play the isotope games with biosignatures. Yeah. Uh, Dave, Ooh. we have a, uh, a special uh, SETI Talks mug here. Um, it's, it's not much of a carbon reservoir at the moment, but it could become one, <laughs> oh, if, it you, could become one. if it goes up with Some your bio, microbial mats up uh, yeah. on the roof at uh, 239, perhaps. Okay. Yeah, feel right. free to put it up there. Yeah, Please join me in, uh, in thanking <laughs> Dave for his great time. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The whale people, they're saying, oh, we hate Mitsubishi, we hate all these salt people, and that's right there, I guess. Yeah, well, the, the particular issue is that um, 